My name is Sydney. I'm a student at the university, and I get the pleasure of introducing our speaker today. So after graduating from Dartmouth University in 1984, Peter Van Dorsen attended Missouri Medical School in 1989. He completed an internship at Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Hospital in Chicago, as well as a general surgery internship at UC Davis. He then performed his residency in otolaryngology at Kaiser. Hi, 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 hi. Whoa. <laughs> Sorry about that. What are you going? Um, Medical Center in Oakland, California. In 1996, he completed a fellowship in neurology at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Von Dorsen has been chief of medical staff at St. Patrick's Hospital since 2008. He served as a president of Montana Society of Otolaryngology from 2006 to 2010, and again from 2016 to 2018. He's on the faculty of the University of Washington ENT department, and he's an adjunct associate professor at the University of Montana. He is also a managing partner at Rocky Mountain ENT. Please welcome Dr. Peter Van Dorsen. Whoop. I think we can turn this one off. Okay. Can you hear me all right? That's a critical question. Is, is, yeah. Sure. My, my field is neurootology. I'm not a neurologist, a neurootologist. So a little bit different in that I deal primarily um, I'm an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and I deal primarily with the lateral aspect of the skull base, the ear, ear reconstruction surgeries. Um, and that was the, the fellowship that I had done at Vanderbilt. Um, are you hearing all right? How is the uh, sound quality? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, all right. So I wanted to talk today about my experience with cochlear implants. I, came to Montana in 1996, and um, I've been doing them now for 25 years, and that just kind of struck me the other day. I don't want to date myself or anything, but I was eight years old when I started doing cochlear implants. <laughs> so um, the, the thing that I want to emphasize the most today is that cochlear implantation is really a team process. And in Montana, we have a pretty big state and a lot of territory, a lot of ground to cover. And I think we all rely quite a bit on each other for um, you know, success with regards to cochlear implantation. Identifying patients properly, I think speech pathology is incredibly important for the success of somebody who's had a cochlear implant, particularly kids. And I describe myself sort of as the installation guy. I'm the guy who just puts in the implant. I'm so sorry, and but we can't hear you. OK. All right. So this is one of my favorite slides with regards to an implant. This is Eve Tolbert, who's an audiologist. And this is probably about 10 or 15 years ago. And this is a little girl who is um, probably about four years old, three or four years old. And this is right when her implant was turned on. And she was just so excited to hear. It was a pretty emotional thing. She was just overjoyed. And she could hear for the first time in her life. Um, and that's something that. Uh, our audiologists at our office are able to experience many times a year. It's a great job for them when they see reactions like this. Um, with adults, you know, especially the elderly, we do a lot of uh, cochlear implants in people who are in their 70s and 80s and even 90s. And that can be very emotional as well because frequently their hearing is very poor. They can't communicate. They become extremely socially isolated. And as you may have read about over the last several years, it's been recognized that social isolation really contributes to cognitive decline. And fortunately, that can be somewhat reversible by improving somebody's hearing. But at all levels, this can be a very emotional process, including just the first time I meet with somebody when they're describing how impaired they are to um, at the very end when it's been turned on. And I describe an implant as something that gives you not an immediate result because it's like learning a new language. And that's where speech pathology comes to play. 
it's very important for somebody to help educate somebody with a cochlear implant how to hear again, how to listen, how to listen to their own voice. And I can't stress that enough. But this is, was just a joyous, joyous occasion. So I wanted to do an overview of cochlear implants. And when I was getting ready for this talk, I kind of enjoyed some of the stories that I was reading about. And you may have heard about a guy named Volta. He's the guy that invented the electric battery. And he did a little experiment where he put metal probes into his ear. And he hooked them up to this battery. And I love this quote. I experienced a jolt in the head, followed by a crackling, jerking, or bubbling as if some dough or thick material was boiling. I thought, that's kind of interesting. That was the first time somebody stimulated their auditory pathway. But you wonder how the brain was doing with all that. So I thought that was a great story. There were um, two um, surgeons in France in the 1950s who had done, a patient, had done a surgery where the stump of the auditory nerve was visible. And postoperatively, somehow, they were able to directly stimulate that stump, and the patient perceived sound. Well, there's a very well named, named or very well known neurotologist, kind of the grandfather of my field, neurotology, in Los Angeles named Bill House. And Dr. House, um, was in his office one day, and a patient came into him and told him about this French study. And he thought, hmm, maybe it's possible to directly stimulate the cochlea, put an electrode wire in there, somehow provide stimulation to the, the cochlea, and maybe somebody can get some form of hearing, at least be able to perceive a noise, like a doorbell ringing, a dog barking, that sort of thing. So he and a guy named John Urban got together and did the first commercially available single electrode wire cochlear implant. And in 1973, that was commercially available. Well, a lot of people didn't like just having a buzz every time a bus went by or a, a, a car honked, something like that. So eventually, multi-channel electrodes were developed where there are more than one electrode within the cochlea so that there could be some perception of different frequencies of sound. Um, so in the 1970s, multi-channel electrode arrays were developed. And in 1985, Cochlear Corporation, which is the biggest and largest of all the cochlear implant companies, developed a commercially available, what was called the Nucleus device, a multi-channel um, cochlear implant. And that started to be implanted far more often in the early 90s. That's when I did my first cochlear implants. By the late 1980s, there were four companies with multi-channel implants. And at that time, we began to hear um, that there were people in the deaf community who were complaining that this was going to cause uh, a cultural genocide, that it was going to eliminate the deaf community. So there was a lot of resistance uh, within the deaf community to going ahead with a cochlear implant through the 80s and 90s, including when I first came to Montana. In uh, 1996, and I'm not sure how to get rid of this stuff at the top of this um, view box, but um, this says cochlear implants in Montana. In 1996, in September, um, I did the first cochlear implant in Montana. And it was a many years disease patient. It was a woman in her 40s. And she had become very socially isolated. She lived with her boyfriend on a ranch. And she had become very withdrawn, and her family was actually worried about her quite a bit. And she came in and talked to me, and we talked about doing a cochlear implant. And she went ahead and had it done, and it worked well. And she ditched the boyfriend, moved into town, started playing the guitar, and has done extremely well. And I see her periodically. She's, she's fantastic. Um, so, in 19, so that was the first implant. In 1997, I did an explant. And it was on one of those patients who had one of those house urban single channel electrode arrays done in Los Angeles by Dr. House. And he, this individual was now a young man. He's probably in his 20s. And he lived in Great Falls. And every time the radar antenna at the airport would go around, he would pick up a buzz. So every minute, he'd have a buzz in his head. So he just stopped wearing it. He couldn't stand it. 
And um, so he went like 10 years with it, an inert you know, device inside his head, and he just wanted it out. He didn't want the newfangled multi-channel electrode array, anything like that, despite you know, any coaxing I could give him. So in 1997, I took that out. It was kind of interesting to see how crude the initial one was compared to how the ones were in the 90s. And I liken the development of a cochlear implant to the development of your cell phone. Think about the cell phones of the 1990s, or kind of a big box, you know, huge thing, looked like a shoe, hold it up to your head. You know, think of Don Johnson in Miami Vice, you know, with this huge telephone. And now we've got these fancy things that, you know, iPhones that could launch a satellite and orbit around the Earth very easily. So um, over time, the implant criteria has really changed. So initially, children had to be over the age of two. They had to be profoundly deaf in both ears. And they had to have really poor word recognition. And over time, those criteria become much more lenient. We're doing implants. And now, actually, with Cochlear Corporation, I can do an implant down to a child nine months old. But most of the kids that I do are 12 months or, old or older. Um, the upper limit of implantation, we can do them on prelingually deaf individuals. Generally, you like to do it before age 18, because the auditory complex of the brain really needs to be stimulated before somebody's 18 years of old, 18 years of age, or it really won't develop very well. For adults, there's really no upper limit in age. And I've done several patients in their 90s who did very well. I mean, obviously, they need to have good cognitive function, good dexterity to manage the implant. But um, they were some of my easiest surgeries. Went home three hours after surgery. We just walked out of the hospital. It was amazing. Um, by 2008, there were 58,000 implants done in the United States. There was a large proportion of children. And as of this year, we've done over uh, 1,100 in Montana. So the state is large. And I just wanted to put this map here because you know, really the medical centers, we're over in Missoula. And then we've got patients from way over here. Billings is really not that far across the state. And you know, I'm seeing patients from up here. I'm seeing patients from North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming. So there's a lot of travel involved in people who want cochlear implants. Um, there are implants now being done in Kalispell. And I think they're starting a program in Billings. Um, I've, I've been working with Billings for the last probably 10 to 15 years. And they do a lot of the programming of the implants that I've done. Um, So speech therapy is in most major cities. And um, I would just was talking to Kitty Griffin, who's been a great help for all of our pediatric patients in the state. And you know, it's great to have somebody who has AV specialty in the state for speech pathology. Um, the School of Deaf and Blind has both an uh, outpatient program and inpatient program or in-house program. And um, we see, as I mentioned, patients from all over surrounding Montana. And I was reading about coordinated decentralized networks versus centralized networks. We don't have the opportunity to have everything in one house. We don't have a speech pathologist, audiologist, pediatrician, soci social worker, or surgeon all in one building. So it's very important that we all sort of coordinate as best as possible to provide care to people undergoing cochlear implantation. So predictors of success. For children, the earlier the implant, the better. If we can do an implant at age 12 months, we're going to get a pretty good hearing result in general. If we wait till a child is 17, then the results are not as good because the little dendritic connections of the brain haven't formed, and it's much harder for them to form. The plasticity of the brain diminishes the older a child gets. Um, parental support is very important, speech and language pathologists and their assessment. If a child is revealed as having superior skills in comprehending facial and gesture expressions, they tend to do pretty well with cochlear implants. Insurance status actually matters a little bit. I wondered about that. And really, it just boils down to the fact 
that people with government insurance have poor outcomes because they have less access to speech pathology, audiology, and less parental education in general. Adults, aged implantation is important, but more important is how long somebody's been deaf. Sometimes I see a patient who became deaf at age 30 and I'm seeing them at age 50, and if they have had no hearing for 50 years, they're not gonna do as well. It's harder to jumpstart the auditory nerve and that whole auditory complex if it hasn't been used for a long time. Um, that being said, we've had some patients who are deaf for 20 years. They took a lot longer to, ability, to develop the ability to recognize sound, but eventually they did pretty well. And they worked with speech pathologists, they listened to a lot of books on tape and read along the words, and things like that eventually paid off. Not as well as somebody who just lost their hearing 12 months ago, but it definitely paid off over time. So overall health is important. And cognitive function is very important. As I mentioned, um, recent studies have shown significant improvement in cognitive subdomains in patients aged between 65 and 86 undergoing a cochlear implant. So cognitive decline can occur associated with hearing loss, but cognitive function can improve by improving somebody's hearing. And I think that's really important. Okay. Barriers to success, delaying diagnosis. So the later the implantation, the worse. And this was a study that, you know, I'm not sure how valid this is in Montana. You might have better information on this than I do, but I read that only 10% of rural children, and I'm not sure what the definition of rural is, but very few, I, I think people in very small towns have access to a speech pathologist. Um, Device malfunction can play a role, obviously. Um, if the device is not working well, if a parent doesn't know how to even put the device on a child's head, that sort of thing, the kid's not gonna do as well. And if parents aren't motivated to help out a child, it's not gonna work. You know, If they're not having the kid wear the device eight hours a day or more, it's not gonna work very well. If the child is throwing it off after 15 minutes, there's no way they're gonna learn how to hear. For adults, um, it's interesting that of the uh, adults with hearing loss, only 10% are recognized and actually go on to get a cochlear implant of those who might be eligible for an implant. Medical issues may prevent an implant. Dementia, obviously, would be one, but other things that could prevent having an implant would be, um, I see a lot of patients who are elderly who have bad cardiac disease or uncontrolled diabetes, that sort of thing. Those are high risk situations. People who are anticoagulated and can't go off their anticoagulation. Those are difficult um, situations. Travel issues are big. I can't tell you how many people I see who just don't want to travel in Montana in the winter. They have no desire to travel six to 12 hours to drive to get surgery done. And then I mentioned cognitive function already. So in terms of the incidence, one child per 1,000 births, and I think it's, it should be not profound, but is born with hearing loss, not profound hearing loss. Um, six out of every 1,000 will have a significant hearing loss. Hearing loss is 20 times more prevalent than these three things, all of which we screen for at birth. And pediatric screening is very important because language development is dependent on appropriate auditory stimulation in the first 18 months of life. If deprived of this, it is unlikely that full language skills will, will develop. So early identification of hearing loss is very important. 41 states have statutes or mandatory universal screening. In 1999, only 47% of infants were screened for hearing loss, and now it's 97%. So, in Montana, you might wonder, when did we start universal screening? It wasn't until 2008. So was, we were pretty late in the game for starting universal screening. Um, initially, identified children, so kids who fail their newborn hearing screen with, um, and we're doing either automated ABR or otoacoustic emission testing on neonates. They're referred to their primary care physician for referral. This is probably more than five now. Um, for a diagnostic ABR. 
Once a baby is identified and confirmed with hearing loss, the, uh, the child is referred to the Montana School of the Deaf and Blind Outreach Program. And then they undergo a subsequent audiology and speech language pathology evaluation. In 2009, there were 33 referrals to MSDB. In 2010, there were 30 plus referrals. Nine were referred during that time period for a cochlear implant consult. And in Montana, we've done about 50 pediatric implants since 1996. Most recently, well, this is going back to 2008, um, 12,000 live births in Montana, 96% were screened, automated ABR versus otoacoustic emission. Those are two techniques of screening for hearing loss. And then a lot of children don't pass initially. They get referred on, have a, have a, um, a second test done, and then eventually they can get referred for an ABR. Many of them have what's called a conductive hearing loss, just secondary to having wax or fluid in the middle ear space. Very few actually have a centroneural hearing loss, and of that, few will have a hearing loss that's so bad that it would require a cochlear implant. Many have hearing loss that's not so bad, and they can just wear a hearing aid. And you can fit a child with a hearing aid down to age, I think it's three months, so pretty early. So most recently, 2019 to 2020, um, there were 42 babies um, in Montana who uh, had a diagnostic ABR, and 20 of those were diagnosed with a permanent hearing loss. Four were referred for a cochlear implant. Um, in 2021, so far this year, two have been referred for a cochlear implant. Total births, 11,000, 10,000. So the births, actually, there were 12,000 in 2008. So um, fewer births, I'm not sure why, but fewer than had been in the past. So recently, House Bill 291 was passed. And it requires that private insurance companies, I'm not sure why I'm getting feedback here. Um, Private insurance companies, are it's now mandated that they cover amplification devices, related accessories and services, speech therapy for all children between age zero and 18. So it's very helpful. Previously, it was just Medicare and Medicaid that had mandatory coverage of those things. So it's really good now that private insurance has to do that as well. And that starts day one of next year, okay? Risk factors for hearing loss in children. Maybe I should stand to the side just a little bit from the speaker. Um, family history of hereditary hearing loss. Infections that can occur during pregnancy in torches, toxoplasmosis, rubella, cytomegalovirus, herpes, um, and syphilis. Craniofacial abnormalities, including the ear, so lack of development of the ear, that can sometimes be a clue. Birth weight less than 1,500 grams, hyperbilirubinemia, ototoxic medications, um, lots of medications can cause hearing loss. Bacterial meningitis, if that's identified, that's kind of a critical issue for a child um, because bacterial meningitis can lead to scar tissue and abnormal bone growth developing within the cochlea, and that can block off the cochlea and make it impossible to get an implant into the cochlea. So if a child has bacterial meningitis, it's imperative that we evaluate them early and implant them early if they've lost their hearing. Typically, we would uh, fit a child with a hearing aid, verify that they've had no benefit from a hearing aid for three to six months, and then do an implant. In bacterial meningitis, we don't have that time window. We have to do an implant pronto. So a very important thing to know. Um, low APGAR scores can be predictive. If a child is in the NICU, and has been on mechanical ventilation for greater than five days, that's highly associated with a nerve type loss. And then there are syndromes known to cause hearing loss. Pendred syndrome, Alport's, Gervais-Lang-Nelson, those are all things that can be associated with hearing loss. So suspicious factors, the parent, the caregiver, a speech pathologist can be very good at recognizing indicators that would suggest that there's hearing loss present, and that's when it's important to do the hearing test. I mentioned bacterial meningitis, head trauma with loss of consciousness or skull fracture. We see that a lot in adults. One of my toughest implants was on 
a poor guy, father of four, was riding his bike, fell, hit his head, broke his temporal bones, and just demolished his cochleas on both sides. And I was only able to put in 12 of the 22 electrodes on one side only. So you got some sound awareness, but that was it. You know, so skull fractures can really hurt the cochlea. Ototoxic meds, um, and then recurrent otitis media, that's usually associated with a conductive loss. Characteristics and milestones of speech development, I think you are all far more the experts on this than I am, but I'll just go through them quickly. Age zero to three, a child turns when spoken to, startles or cries, awakens to loud sounds, cries differently for different needs. Age four to six months, a child responds to no. I don't know, I have two kids, I'm not sure how they, how they do with the no thing. Um, look for the source of new sounds. Uh, they look for the source of new sounds, notices toys with sounds, babbling, more speech-like, make gurgling sounds, sounds or gestures. In age seven months to one year, child recognizes words for cup, shoe, juice, turns to name, has one to two words of speech, though not clear, and babbling with long and short groups of sounds. Okay. Um, so speech, the role of the speech and language pathologist for the early detection of hearing loss, typically there's a referral from a parent or a pediatrician for speech delay or possible attention disorder. Um, after parents, speech and language pathologists are the best predictors of hearing loss in kids. And pediatric hearing loss can be progressive and sometimes not picked up until kindergarten, unfortunately. And again, early detection is just such the important thing. Characteristics of speech and hearing impaired children, and these are all terms that you are far more familiar with than I am, but use of negative intraoral air pressure, and I assume that's talking while inhaling, would that be an example of that? Um, altered voice onset time, high oral pressures, high jitter and shimmer, and high noise to harmonic ratio. So etiologies of hearing loss in children, developmental or acquired hearing loss is 30% of that. And that can include bony abnormalities of the inner ear. The inner ear just doesn't develop properly. It can include those infections I mentioned during pregnancy. And there can be um, uh, problems with how the membranes of the inner ear develop. High bilirubin levels can also contribute. The majority, though, are genetic. and. Um, Genetic hearing loss can be syndromic, things like Treacher Collins syndrome, Usher syndrome, Pendran syndrome, or non syndromic, which are the majority of them. So they're not associated with any other problem. There is almost no chromosome which is without its genetic location that can be associated with hearing loss. So I do a genetic screen, I'll show you a slide in just a second. It screens for over 200 genes that can be associated with hearing loss. And now we can just do an oral swab and send it off to a lab and we get a result. Before we had to draw blood, we'd only screen for two or three genes and it would cost like $1,500. Now it's a $250 lab test and it screens for 204 genes and it's phenomenal. And just based on this, you can see that if somebody has any kind of chromosomal deletion or alteration, they could have hearing loss as well, okay? Um, so this just gets into the whole genetic screening thing. There are 200 genes, 204 genes that are screened for both syndromic and non-syndromic loss. It's an oral swab. It doesn't cost nearly as much as it used to. And the corporation that we use is called Invitae, but there are others that are out there. Risks for progressive hearing loss include children that were born prematurely. They can have progressive loss over time. So even though a child may have passed their neonatal screen, we gotta follow them to see if they drop off over time. Connexin 26 disorder, that's the most common of the genetic disorders that can cause hearing loss. Pendreds can be associated with thyroid issues and there are plenty of other genetic causes. Those things have to be followed because the hearing can decline over time. Then osseous abnormalities, vestibular aqueduct syndrome. That's where there's a conduit between the posterior fossa of the head and the inner ear, 
any blow to the head in somebody with vestibular aqueduct syndrome can result in progressive hearing loss. So children who have hearing loss and undergo a CT scan or MRI and are diagnosed as having that cannot participate in sports that are likely to cause head trauma. And I see, I just saw a patient like this two or three days ago. Um, I just did surgery on an, um, decompressing the vestibular um, sac, an endolymphatic sac. So this is, this is something that comes up fairly often. Mondini's malformation, that's also called a type two um, incomplete partition. I'll show a slide of that in just a second. And then there are all these other disorders that we talked about already. So what is a cost-effective screening for hearing loss in a child? Well, I, I like to get a scan when I see a child who has hearing loss and has been identified with a loss. We want to try to identify the cause of the loss. We want to see if it's a syndromic issue where we have to screen for other things like thyroid problems. And um, an MRI is probably the most effective of the scans that I could get, but requires that a child, a young child, a baby, generally undergo a general anesthesia. So that can be a little bit stressful for a parent, or a lot stressful. A CT scan is much faster and much less expensive, but doesn't give us information about the nerve of hearing or the brain. Physical exam, um, an assessment for whether they're a candidate for um, a cochlear implant is important. Genetic screening. We used to do an EKG, urinalysis, a check for syphilis, thyroid function tests, all sorts of different tests, but they're not cost effective. The most cost effective tests are scanning and genetic screening to try to determine why somebody has hearing loss. So this is just an example of an incomplete partition. The cochlea is not developed. It doesn't have two and three quarter turns. And in this scan, this is a similar, the same person or the same scan. There's an enlarged internal auditory canal. And you can't see it very well, but the, um, the carotid artery is very large in this person and actually has what's called a persistent stapedial artery. So sometimes a CAT scan alone will show a lot. This is just what things look like when there's incomplete partition type 1, just a common small cavity versus a Mondini, which is an incomplete partition type two, versus a normal ear, a normal cochlea, which has two and three quarter turns. So I just had to have a little cartoon here while I get a little drink. I hear kids talking about earwigs all the time, and I've never seen an earwig, so. I've seen bugs, but not earwigs. Um, so hearing loss in adolescence. There was just a study that was done in 2010 at Brigham's and Women's in Boston, which showed that there's a fairly high prevalence of hearing loss in adolescents too. So I think many of you probably see teenagers and they're listening to their iPods, iPhones, whatever devices at loud volume. And it's just important to know that they might have hearing loss and that might be contributing to their inability to pay attention, that sort of thing. So, and you know, you see all these diagnoses of attention deficit disorder, it could be hearing loss. So just something to stay, stay aware of. Um, treatment options for kids with hearing loss, total communication programs through, such as through MSDB, which would provide uh, education with sign language, lip reading, speech, cochlear implantation with supplemental skills and speech therapy, and even sign language with the cochlear implant. You know, all of that is great. The more means you have to communicate, the better. Um, or some people prefer just to be, non, to be nonverbal and use sign language only. So what does a cochlear implant do? I have a little video in a second, but um, many of you are probably already familiar with what it does. It's a device which bypasses the absent or deficient sensory hair cells within the cochlea. So the device is a series of electrodes that goes down into the cochlea that directly stimulates the auditory nerve. So there's a microphone, a sound processor, which does a Fourier analysis of the sound, converts it all to digital sine waves, converts those sine waves into various frequencies to stimulate the various electrodes that correspond to those frequencies down in the cochlea. And the cochlea is arranged, if you were to unwind the cochlea, 
The high frequencies would be closest to the outside world, and the low frequencies would be further out into the cochlea towards what's called the apex of the cochlea. And because it's arranged in what's called a tonotopic arrangement, we can stimulate those different frequencies at firing rates up to 100,000 times per second and stimulate points between all the electrodes with a pretty complex software that goes into the whole processor. So um, the internal implant is placed. The surgery, I just did one this morning, took about an hour. Um, it can take longer if the cochlea is maldeveloped or if there are some inner ear abnormalities that can make it a longer procedure. I place the electrode array into the cochlea and some devices have only 16 electrodes and have them spaced a little further out so they can stimulate between the electrodes. And other devices of those four manufacturers have 24 electrodes. And you can virtually stimulate up to 120 points within the cochlea. A normal cochlea has 30,000 hair cells, each of which is hooked up to a nerve. So a normal cochlea is like a piano with 30,000 keys. And with a cochlear implant, we've only got a piano with 120 keys, but we can stimulate at a much higher firing rate. So it's not quite as filled with the cacophony of sounds. OK, and as I mentioned, um, here's a little video. Let me just click on this. Let's see if this works here. And the tricky part's going to be going from the video back to the slideshow. The Synchrony Cochlear Implant System is designed to restore hearing to individuals with severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss. Individuals with this type of hearing loss have serious difficulty hearing and may not hear at all, or may only be able to hear very loud sounds. The Synchrony Cochlear Implant System consists of the externally worn Sonnet audio processor and the internal Synchrony Cochlear Implant. The Sonnet audio processor is worn comfortably behind the ear. The Synchrony Implant is surgically placed under the skin and a flexible electrode array is inserted into the cochlea. The cochlea is the part of the inner ear that converts sound waves into nerve signals, which the brain processes as hearing. The apical region of the cochlea is responsible for detecting low-pitched sounds, while the basal region is responsible for detecting high-pitched sounds. The cochlea is lined with thousands of sensory cells, known as hair cells, which detect sound waves and send sound information as nerve signals through the auditory nerve to the brain. For individuals with severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss, most of these hair cells do not function normally and are not able to send these nerve signals properly. A cochlear implant system bypasses these non-functioning hair cells by using electrical pulses to send sound signals directly to the auditory nerve. To achieve this, the Sonnet audio processor detects environmental sounds and digitally converts them into coded electrical signals. Sonnet transmits these signals through the skin to the implant by a communication coil. The implant translates these coded signals into electrical pulses, which are transmitted along the electrode array to stimulate specific locations of the cochlea responsible for specific pitches. This targeted stimulation across the whole cochlea provides a more accurate pitch perception for better sound quality. By mimicking the natural function of hair cells, these pulses can deliver sound signals directly to the auditory nerve. These signals are then transmitted by the auditory nerve to the brain, where they are interpreted as sound. The advanced technology of the Synchrony Cochlear Implant System enables our recipients with severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss to enjoy their best possible hearing. If you'd like to learn more about our other hearing implants. I'll just stop right there. It's a bit of an advertisement after that. But I thought it was a pretty good um, description and cartoon about how the cochlear implants work. Um, let's just go on here. So this, again, just shows a cochlea being unwound. This is the labyrinth of the inner ear, the balance system. This is the cochlea being unwound. 
low frequency sounds would be out at the apex and the high frequencies down at the base. And as a sound wave propagates through the cochlea, it will maximally deflect one area of the cochlea. And that will, in a normal ear, send a nerve signal into the auditory nerve and onto the brain. And that's just not happening normally in somebody who has a severe hearing loss. So once again, just the arrangement, the very high frequency sounds at the very base, the entrance into the cochlea, and the very low frequency sounds as you get further in. So candidacy requirements for a cochlear implant. Children age, 20, age, age 12 months to 17 years need to have a severe to profound bilateral loss. They've used a hearing aid for six months in the younger children, or three months if they're um, between the age of zero and two. And they have to be demonstrated as having little to no benefit with hearing aids. There's a mean auditory integrated score, MAIS. And that's one of the tests we use for screening. Uh, it's just listed right here. And um, we'll also do what's called an MLNT test for the slightly older kids. And other factors that are important is, you know, the really it's the family's got to be motivated about this. And it's also important that they have realistic expectations. They don't just go home with a kid who just had a cochlear implant, leave it on for 15 minutes and say it doesn't work and, and let things ride. So you know, a lot of coaching, a lot of support is very important with cochlear implants. And there have to be no medical contraindications for surgery. So the candidacy requirements, when you look at the audiogram, generally there's a loss. This is at the should be the 70 decibel line down through 80 and down into the profound. So severe ranging to profound. And this just puts it into writing. The, um, yeah, both groups, high motivation and appropriate um, expectations from the family. That's pretty important. For adults, the indications are, uh, uh, candidacy, no medical contraindications. We use a test called an AZ biosentence test score. So it's a, it's a quiz, it's a test where a sentence is read to somebody and they have to repeat back all the words and we see what percentage of the words they get correct. Some people are amazing. They have an absolute profound loss and you'd expect them to get no words correct but they're so good at taking fragments of words and putting a sentence together that they actually do much better on this test than you would expect. Um, other people have, can't do that, and they score poorly on this test, but it's probably the best test we have in terms of determining the hearing level that somebody has and whether they're a candidate. We add background noise to the test to really stimulate true listening conditions, because it's very unusual that we are in a world that is completely devoid of background noise. So Medicare has stricter criteria than private insurance. Your score on the AZ bio has to be 40% or less versus 50% on the worse ear and 60% on the better ear for adults. And the hearing loss range can be from the 40 decibel level down into the profound level. So it's a little more lenient with adults than in little kids. And again, this just arrow puts a little more definition to everything. We're also doing um, cochlear implants now in people who are deaf in one ear. And that's a new thing as of about a year and a half to two years ago. It was approved by the FDA for the manufacturer known as MedL. And they have a long, very flexible array that goes pretty deep into the cochlea and they feel that it stimulates low frequency hearing well and is better at reproducing natural sounding speech. And one of the complaints some people have with cochlear implants is that initially it's really good at high frequency, but poor at lows. So people tend to almost sound like their speech has been transposed into the higher frequencies, like cartoon characters. Um, and that can be very bothersome to some people. They say you sound like Mickey Mouse, or you know, they say that women sound like men, they can't distinguish the two, and it takes a while for them to overcome that and for it to sound more natural. The deeper insertion and the stimulation of the lower frequencies helps with that. And for that reason, MedL Corporation was able to get approval 
for implants for people who are deaf in just one ear, as long as it's less than five years ago that the hearing loss began. They have to have pretty poor hearing in that one ear and very poor word recognition. That's a single syllable word recognition score. And the, the advantages are pretty large. They're able to have improved hearing and noise. They're able to localize sound. And they no longer have that head shadow effect where they feel like they just don't have any hearing from one side. The head is in the way of them hearing sounds from their deafened side. So getting ready for surgery, we review equipment. Our audiologists are really good at that. It's very important that a relationship be established with the speech therapist or an auditory verbal trainer. And there are a lot of reading resources that are really important, and hopefully people read them. I'm not sure how often that happens, but it's really critical. Um, CT scan or an MRI to verify that the cochlea is patent, that I can not actually do the surgery and then vaccinations to limit the risk of meningitis. The surgery, again, a couple hours, if um, including anesthesia time. The actual surgery time is about an hour. For kids, I like to have a pediatric anesthesiologist. Um, it's typically an outpatient procedure, though sometimes with kids, when I do both ears, I'll keep them overnight in the hospital. Um, we have a one-week follow-up visit, and then we actually turn on the device about three weeks after surgery. We do the programming of the device in kids while they're asleep. We can do what's called neural response telemetry and figure out the exact stimulation levels that work for that child so that when we actually have them into the office to turn it on, we already have the settings that we need and we know the resistance levels of each electrode and we know where to program it and set it. So we're just starting from a known point, which is really amazing technology. So the risks of surgery, there are risks with every surgery, and these are discussions I have every day with patients. Risks of facial nerve injury, change in taste, bleeding infection, meningitis imbalance, wound, wound breakdown, wound infections. Fortunately, none of those happen very often. Um, they're very, very rare, and we've had really good luck with our patients in terms of no facial nerve injuries. It's very rare that somebody gets a change in taste. Bleeding, the blood loss is very little. For whatever reason, our infection rate is super low. Never had a case of meningitis. Imbalance can occur in the elderly, and I'm actually doing a study at the University of Montana with the uh, physical therapy department where we're studying balance function in the elderly who have a cochlear implant. Um, and there aren't any such studies that have been done in the country, so that's gonna be kind of interesting over the next few years. Wound breakdown is very unusual. I did have one patient who was she was probably in her 70s. She had been going through a very difficult time. Her son had just been arrested for something. And she weighed about 110 pounds when I met her. And at the time of surgery, she weighed about 90. She had almost no subcutaneous fat. And she had a habit of just kind of picking at her incision after surgery. And she broke down the skin over her implant. I had to take it out because it got infected. I had her start gaining weight, <laughs> you know, eat a lot of milkshakes and um, drink a lot of milkshakes. And then she gained weight back. Her social situation improved, implanted the other side, and she did really well. But things like that can happen. Um, this is a picture of a normal cochlea. Just, I thought this was nice because you can see all these little nerves that come and go towards the center of the cochlea, which is called the medialis, and that's where the auditory nerve is. And when we do the implant, there are three chambers to the cochlea. The scale of vestibuli, the scale of media, and the scale of tympani. This is where the implant goes, and the electrodes get very close to where the nerve is, right there. We don't implant into here. We don't want to ruin functional nerves that are still there. And this, when, if we implant here, it tends, as the implant coils around the inside, that would not be as close, and that would put the organ of corti at risk. So with the surgeries that we do now, the electrodes are much smaller than they have ever been. And when you insert an electrode array into the cochlea, it's a very soft, flexible tip that sort of sends its way in on its own in a chamber of fluid and is very atraumatic. And a lot of our patients who have a small amount of residual hearing save that hearing despite having had surgery. In the early implants, the devices were a lot bigger, and the device could actually completely fill up this and actually cause damage to the organ of Cordy. 
so they would lose residual hearing, and that's no longer the case. We preserve about 70 to 80% of the time, we're preserving residual hearing. Um, this is what the tip of the electrode looks like. The um, small, this is the electrode array with its individual little electrodes along here. This is a little wire or stylet. And as you insert this into the cochlea, you back out the stylets so this begins to curve inside the cochlea. So the stylet is withdrawn. This is one of my favorite types of electrodes because it coils tight, tightly against the medialis where the nerve is, as opposed to an electrode array that goes around the outside of the cochlea and is farther away from the nerve. So you can see these little platinum electrodes here. Um, and this is what it looks like just curved on its own. This is actually an auditory brainstem electrode where eight electrodes can be placed right onto the brainstem at the cochlear nucleus by going into what's called the foramen of Lushka. And I only did those during my fellowship. I have not done those in Montana. So the incision is behind the ear. Actually, it's a little bit closer to the ear, but that's just the instrument that's provided by Cochlear, and Cochlear Corporation. And then with surgery, I don't have a surgical video, but this is the facial nerve right here. And there's a little gap right in here between the facial nerve and a nerve of taste. It's a little V triangle that I go through to get down to the cochlea. So it's a little area that is about a millimeter and a half wide. And I have to go between the facial nerve and the nerve of taste through a small gap to get down to the cochlea, open up a little window into the cochlea, and feed in the array of electrodes. So this is what's called the mastoid cavity right here. This is the mastoid bone behind the ear. That's what I go through. And then I drill out a little well in the skull so that that device that you saw can sit down into the skull a little bit so that people don't have a big bump behind their ear underneath the skin. So bilateral implants are what I typically do in kids who are profoundly hearing impaired. They provide sound localization. They provide better hearing and noise, better sound awareness and stereo sensation, and they're cost effective, including to, uh, um, as determined by quality of life studies. The cons of doing a pediatric bilateral implant is that it's a longer surgery. It can take about three and a half hours. And um, there's the potential for balance to be impaired, but I haven't really seen that in kids at all. This is, you know, a lot of people do complain of ringing, and some people were doing cochlear implants just because of tinnitus. Um, tinnitus can be made worse initially after a cochlear implant, but generally most people, when you turn on the device, do a lot better, and their tinnitus is much reduced. So what is the future of hearing loss? And I just threw this in because this was an interest of mine. I did a lot of research at the university for a while, on um, putting an engineered virus called adeno-associated virus um, that we had uh, put a green fluorescent protein attached to in an effort to insert new genetics into the cochlea. And the thought that, was, if, uh, that we had was that eventually, um, if a genetic cause of hearing loss could be determined, we could potentially change the genetics of the inner ear. And we did that for about five years here at the university. That work, there's work now similar to that that's being done at Harvard, and they've actually successfully, in some mouse models, changed the genetics of the cochlea. But MATH1 was a gene that we had identified because it causes differentiation of support cells into hair cells. And in some people, if you can put MATH, or in, it's theorized that in a mouse model, if you put MATH1 genes into a cochlea, it can cause support cells to differentiate into a hair cell and you might get hearing back. That's kind of the holy grail of genetic treatment of hearing loss. And um, so I'm just gonna, it's kind of relevant now because of everything that's going on in genetics and you know, adenovirus is the Trojan horse that's being used for insertion of uh, spike proteins for immunizations that we get. But this is stuff that we were doing 10 years ago here at the university, it was pretty exciting. This is probably going to need to be combined with stem cells to provide the raw material for cellular, cellular material in the cochlea so that hair cells can be developed to 
help people who have deafness. But this is just an example of green fluorescent protein fluorescing within, these are actually the outer hair cells of the cochlea. So that we considered a success, and that was kind of an exciting thing. And we had a grant for several years doing that here at the university. So um, post-operative care of the, pediatric, uh, uh, of the pediatric cochlear implant patient, and right up a, what's not showing here is speech pathologist's role. Um, <laughs> It's especially important in pediatrics. I can't say that enough. Because besides the parent, the most important predictor of long-term speech development is speech therapy routinely provided. And routinely provided is also important. Not just one or two visits, but ongoing. 12 months, two years. And it's important to have a relationship with the speech pathologist prior to surgery. Tasks given to the parents, homework for the parents to work with their kid, that's also very important. Distances and weather, especially in our huge state, can impair routine visits. And progress over time can lead to children who are mainstreamed in school. And it's just amazing how kids are doing in the classroom. And future employment opportunities are much better because, like it or not, I think deaf people are discriminated against in terms of getting jobs. A lady yesterday told me she wasn't able to get a job because of her hearing loss. And she was so upset about it and so excited about getting a cochlear implant. Um, and um, oops, sorry about that. So mainstream children, future employment, and awareness in general that this is available. It's so common that I see somebody in the office who comes to see me because they know somebody who's had a cochlear implant. It's not because of something they read. It's not research they did. It's word of mouth, which is really, really effective, especially in Montana. So speech language pathologist in the adult patient is also very, very important. Routine visits, homework, objective measurements of improvement are important. As with children, distance and weather can be impediments to therapy. And as you know, this is a rural state, and there are many small towns with no local speech language pathologist. And communication and congeniality with other members of what is definitely a decentralized network is critical. Um, so this is just a closing slide. It's a sunset in the Himalayas. And uh, that, I think, is all I have. So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks. Yes? I am very curious about how you explain to your patients what their sound expectations are going to be, or what they're, what, how they're going to hear, because I know cochlear implants don't give you the hearing that somebody with no hearing loss would experience. And so how do you describe that to your patients, especially those young kids? Or maybe yeah. the better question would be like, versus somebody that's been deaf their whole life versus somebody that has had experience hearing. Well, there's quite a range. You know, when somebody's been deaf their whole life, we really downplay the expectations because um, we're hoping to just get sound awareness that they'll be able to, you know, and, and so many people come into that situation. I have several um, young people in their 20s who were educated through the School of the Deaf and Blind, and some of their friends got an implant. So they're already kind of aware that it's not going to be great hearing. It's been so long that they've been deaf. And typically, they come in to see me and they say, I just want to be able to hear my child when my child cries. And that's a really common thing that I've heard probably 10 times in the last two years. And I say, I think we can do that. You know, and that's a pretty realistic thing. And on top of that, it's possible you'll get some words over time or word recognition over time. I think your question is most relevant for the elderly patient. You know, because they have expectations initially, frequently, that you just turn this thing on and they're going to hear perfectly from day one. And you have to go through with them and say, listen, at first it's going to sound more robotic, more computer generated. It's going to be a higher shift in frequencies. It's going to sound like Mickey Mouse or a cartoon character. And I think, if anything, you really try to downplay their expectations because they may have met somebody who's had their implant for a year and says it's fantastic. You know, and that's tough. And so often now, you can find somebody in your town who's had a cochlear implant. I think of Red Lodge, Montana. I think I've done five cochlear implants on people who live in Red Lodge, Montana. 
So like everybody's going to know that person or those people in Red Lodge and have these lofty expectations. So I think my job more than anything is downplaying their expectations and going through that whole robotic thing and the duration of time it takes to learn how to hear. For parents, you know, I think parents initially have that expectation sometimes that the kid will get a cochlear implant and be talking the next day. You know, and what you have to say to parents is, we'll do a cochlear implant, but your child is going to be starting at day zero now, just like an infant. They're going to have some sound going into their brain, and their brain, you know, brains work by pattern recognition. Their brains have to establish patterns of hearing and hopefully eventually patterns that lead to the recognition of speech and then maybe even to the production of their own speech. And you have to go through that. I mean, it's a very systematic issue. And you know, some people don't understand all of pattern recognition and, and why their child isn't hearing well from day one, even though they've had no hearing for two years. You know, but hopefully, between the audiologists and hopefully speech the pathologists and me, they kind of get that message that it is very much a work in progress. Other questions? I, I can, well, you got it. Okay, got it. Could you speak to auditory neuropathy dyssynchrony disorder and has the criteria for that type of disorder changed with, for cochlear implant? It depends what the cause is. And there are some genetic causes of auditory neuropathy and dyssynchrony. Um, some children do very well with a cochlear implant who have that condition and others don't. It's a little bit less predictable of how they are going to do because they've got some hair cell function, but there can be issues with the neuri their neurites and how they connect the hair cells to the cochlea. And will a cochlear implant overcome that and be able to directly stimulate things? And how will that work? You know, it's thought that the, the fact that you've only got 22 electrodes or 24 electrodes, it's much easier for the brain to understand than an auditory dyssynchrony situation where you might have 30,000 hair cells that might work but aren't effectively connected to the auditory nerve. So it's a less predictable situation. And it's a trickier thing in terms of indications and expectations with the parents. But no good early indicators of who might do well. You said there's some genetic causes. Mm -hmm. Are there some genetic causes that do less better or more better? Or yeah, it's there's, still just unpredictable? Well, there's a protein called oterfalin. And some kids who produce that protein do better who have an auditory neuropathy. So genetic testing can be helpful in that situation in terms of who might do better or worse. I mean, I have one child who has that condition. And actually, all the testing showed that this child had just horrendous hearing. And we did the implant. The child was doing great. And then sometimes the child would actually hear well without the implant, get sick, and then the hearing would be terrible. And over time, the hearing just was terrible all the time. And the child did very well with the implant. So that, again, it's less predictable. But indications are not quite the same as in terms of what you just saw up on the board there. I have more, but Kitty's here too, so this kind of relates to Kitty as well, maybe. But just you know, you brought up the rural state of Montana and access to speech paths, but we do so much teletherapy. I wonder, like I know Kitty, in your role, you work so much um, with kiddos who had cochlear implants. Do you see that that's that's been really effective to use teletherapy? So I guess this is a question for Peter or Kitty. I'll let Kitty go. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that, Julie, that is a really good question. And um, my experience with kids that are bilaterally implanted is it depends on where they are in their rehab. You know, if what I really want, what I always want, is to have the parent right next to me and we experience the treatment together and then they go home with homework and they do that all week and then they come back. But when COVID shut my clinic down, um, it was a couple weeks before we got everybody up on a screen. And the acoustics was not my favorite. You know, I had a headset on, 
and a mic. And I, I felt like I couldn't hear the children as well as when they're in the room with me, but it beats having nothing available. So, and we did it, you know, we came, came out the other side and people are coming back in the clinic. Um, the mask situation is, is rough. So I have a, like a plexiglass on my therapy table, which is now in the waiting room instead of the small pediatric room because we want to get a little distance between us. But we're, we're doing it. I mean, and, and you guys are all doing it. So carry on. How are, how are your kids doing? I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so I have... Um, here. Two little guys that were implanted very early on here in Montana, and they are now in high school um, and are not requiring an IEP. They're working on a 504 with accommodations, and I barely see them in my role as uh, Montana School for the Deaf and Blind Outreach because they don't need me. Um, I also have a first grader that was at your clinic, Dr. Von Dorsten, and she, her reading level is above her peers. Above. <laughs> Bilaterally implanted little one mm -hmm. above reading level, and that's often the sticking point for mm -hmm. kids educationally. So. Have, you, have you noticed over time that the implants and the, uh, the programming strategies are evolving and more effective and you're seeing kids doing better? I than have. Mm -hmm. I have. Um, I, I started as an SLP 33 years ago, and the first patient that I had had one electrode. So it was on and off, mm -hmm. and that was it. So I'm watching this over the course of my career in 22, 24 electrode situations, and some of the kids can hear me across the clinic um, with no speech reading availability. They can't even see me, mm -hmm. and they can hear me down the hall. Mm -hmm. It's it has revolutionized what I do for a living, and I have to kind of be on my toes. Because <laughs> it will change again, I'm sure. Well, what impresses me, too, is when I see some of these children coming in the, into the clinic, their speech is normal. I it's, know. it's not deaf in speech. Their consonants are excellent. And I can't believe that this kid has a cochlear implant. I mean, that's, that's what I've seen time and time again, especially with effective speech therapy. Yeah. I wish I could do it all day long. <laughs> I know if there were enough people in my area, I would just see one little CI person after another. Yeah. But this is Montana. Well, thank you, and thanks for your years of doing oh, this. My great honor. Thank you. Did you have more questions? You mentioned the advent of, of um, let's see, it was Midel mm -hmm. that is available for unilateral loss. Right. And then you mentioned the difference in the structure of that electrode. Mm -hmm. Do you think Advanced Bionics and Cochlear Corp are not far behind, or is the structure of their electrode going to impede that? It's really interesting. Every manufacturer will tell you that theirs is the best exactly. and give you a reason for it and say that depth of insertion and length of electrode array doesn't matter, you know, and then Medel will say it matters a lot. And um, some will say that it doesn't matter whether it's a cochlear electrode array that hugs the medialis, the inside of the cochlea. It's better to have one that goes around the outside because it's softer, it does less damage on the insertion. Every manufacturer has their theory about what is best for an implant. Um, from the standpoint of doing sing single-sided deafness, there's only one that's FDA approved. And I've seen some patients who just love it. You know, and it's hard to argue with that. And it's hard to argue with them saying, because they have a good basis of comparison, that the sound is pretty natural sounding and that they like that lower frequency hearing. So when they say that to me, and I have direct feedback with somebody who has normal hearing on one ear and a cochlear implant on the other, and they say that the cochlear implant side actually sounds pretty natural, that's pretty compelling to me. So I tend to really rely a lot on my impression that my patients give back to me. And so if somebody who doesn't have a super thin, very, very flimsy, it's like inserting a noodle up into a wet straw, I mean, it's so flimsy, the one by Medel. 
it's such a difficult insertion because <laughs> it's such a, a hard one to get into the cochlea. Once it's in, it inserts fine, but it's just wiggling everywhere but going into the cochlea. Um, once it's in, it does great. And I think it's extremely atraumatic. And if somebody says that it's working well and giving them natural hearing, I pay a lot of attention to that. Are you doing all four companies? I'm doing three. The fourth is brand new. It's Oticon. They developed uh, an implant, or they bought a company that was in um, southern France. Oticon is probably the biggest hearing aid manufacturer in the world, and they finally jumped into this game. Um, I think that over time, they'll have a pretty good implant, but my issue with it right now is that it doesn't have it has Bluetooth capability, but you have to wear that neck device as an intermediary to get Bluetooth to your cochlear implant. It's hard for me to recommend that when these other three manufacturers are really doing a great job and it's direct to the implant Bluetooth technology. You know? So I think, I think Oticon will be there within a year or two, and they do have um, enormous resources, especially with their development of all these noise canceling technologies and their Bluetooth technologies. They have so much money and so many resources that I think they're ultimately going to have a pretty good implant. But I haven't started doing theirs yet. I actually just read an article the other day. It's not an article, but um, they've actually recalled their devices hmm. in the last week hmm. and don't anticipate any new ones until mid-2022. Interesting. Yeah. My, uh, there's a rep who sent me something about that, you know, sort of vaguely worded about three days ago. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and again, I think that's the situation where you want to make sure something's working quite well be before you start doing it. Um, I'm just curious if um, you have seen any, like, new and upcoming um, wearable headbands or um, things for little, little, little kids, like two years old. I'm thinking mm -hmm. of a client that I worked with mm -hmm. um, that would take it off constantly because yeah. it was irritating or it was, you know, it's like putting a hat on a baby. Mm -hmm. They just take it off. So is there anything up and coming that you've seen? There are definitely some headbands that are out there. Um, and that's uh, the, our audiologists are pretty familiar with them and um, have used them definitely with the little ones to help the implants stay on. Like, I think about girls looking cute with their headbands. But exactly. What about boys? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, I mean, yeah, please. We should have you two sit close together, so. <laughs> I would say that that's a, um, a question that should be a red flag for the cochlear implant audiologist, because um, many children with hearing aids fight them but cochlear implants, it's often most common that they don't fight them as much. So I would be wondering if there is a change in the map that's needing to happen, that maybe they're resisting the levels of sound and that may have, may have changed, or maybe there's something at the site well, of even, the implant. Or, or, know, the, or the magnet strength is too high. Right. So I would say that's a, that's a good referral for the parent to just have the cochlear mm -hmm. implant audiologist check it out. The other thing I would say, there's um, a product made by Hannah Anderson, and it's a, it's a pilot's cap, and it's a very thin um, knit cap, and it's been tested um, that auditory sound is not um, influenced by that type of fabric, and that can be really effective for, I mean, they, they tie, you know, they tie right on the, and their parents like them, they're really, they're really cute. And I think there are some parents who actually made special custom devices that they put online that they make for other families. Kitty was just nodding her head. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That seems a great place. Yeah. They're the ones dealing with it all the time, so of course we have it. Right, right. Since I have the mic, I'll ask my, one of my other questions. So what's happening with... Just one with, of your others? <laughs> um, I know that originally different device companies were starting at the, for, say, the kids younger than two with a body worn where right. it's clipped on, and then it's moved up later. What's happening currently with the variety of companies? Are they starting ear level? I mean, the danger of ear level is, uh, is 
them falling off or the kids yeah, of taking course. them off. So I was just curious what's happening there. You know, most kids are wearing ear level, but then there's also the single device that just goes right over the magnet, nothing on the ear itself. And a lot of patients love those. Is that just um, mid -L, or do the others no, have that? No, all three have that. Yeah, yeah. And actually, the uh, Coca Corporation and Advanced Bionics, that's also um, much better from a Bluetooth perspective and multiple microphones. So noise canceling is better. MedL has good technology, but they're not quite as advanced with the Bluetooth and the um, uh, multiple mics with their, not the ear level device, but the, the implant level device as uh, Advanced Bionics and Cochlear Corporation. So, I mean, all this is evolving, and what's even evolving is the one that's totally implantable. There have been uh, some totally in, implantable prototypes that have been done in Australia. And the issue there is what do you use for your microphone? And the logical answer is you use the eardrum as the microphone. But then you have to have a piezoelectric connection between that and the actual device, which is implanted in the skull. And the most complicated issue there is powering the device. Where would you have a battery? And the thought is you might have something like a pacemaker battery actually down over your clavicle with a wire connection. So, you know, there are, I think, technologies that will evolve over the next probably five to ten years that could be pretty fantastic. So you've been doing surgeries all day and you can't speak with us. <laughs> Not all day. Usually I'm operating until six or seven, so this is great. It's only four forty. Yeah. This is my my busy day, so this is a, a great break. It was really nice to see sunlight today. It's really. Fun.